Just when it seemed like comedian Red Skelton had everything, he lost the only thing that mattered to him. He had two children and loved them with all of his heart, but one of them met an unspeakably brutal end. But more on this later. Richard Skelton or Red Skelton is an odd name for a boy born in 1913 in Indiana. And it seems like from the very beginning, he suffered from an identity crisis. When one of his teachers called him a liar for saying his name was Red, he made up the name Bernard instead. It would go on to be one of his many alter egos. Skelton's father, much like the famous entertainer himself, worked as a clown. But the elder Skelton passed before Red was ever born. You might say that his father brought the house down. The big tent at the circus where he worked fell on him, ending his career and his life. What's more, there was nothing funny about Red's childhood. After his father had his unfortunate accident at the circus, the Skelton family fell into crippling poverty. They were so poor growing up that their neighbors didn't want anything to do with them. When young Red Skelton tried to spark up a romance with one of his neighbors, the girl's parents broke it off, believing that he would be poor forever. But Skelton proved them so wrong. To help the family pay their bills, Skelton likely lied about his age to get a job as a newspaper boy. There wasn't much money in it, but the funny kid got good at pestering people until they purchased a paper just to get him to finally shut up. Funny enough, this small gig gave him the big break that he needed. One day, when Skelton was selling his papers, a man passed him by and asked him, what do they do in this town for excitement? Always as helpful, Skelton pointed across the street to the marquee on a theater and said, there's a big New York road show in town tonight with a comedian. Edwin. It was the chance encounter of a lifetime. Even from a young age, Skelton always knew that he wanted to be an entertainer, just like his father, minus the collapsing Big Ten, of course. He continued telling the friendly stranger, that's what I'm going to do when I get older. I'm going to make people laugh. At the time, Skelton had no idea that the joke was in on him. The friendly stranger asked Skelton if he was going to attend the roadshow. Embarrassed, Skelton had to tell him that he wouldn't be going. No, the little red-headed kid lamented, I don't have that kind of money. In response, the stranger did the unthinkable. He proceeded to pull out a dollar and buy the rest of Skelton's papers along with a balcony seat to the roadshow. Flush with cash, a whole dollar, Skelton rushed home and gave the money to his mother. Frugal as always, she gave him back a dime so that he could buy goodies at the show. When Skelton arrived at the theater and took a seat, he was in for a big surprise. The kid had no way of knowing that he was the guest of honor. The friendly stranger who had purchased Skelton's ticket emerged from behind the red curtains. It was Ed Wind himself. During the intermission, Wind took Skelton back to see the audience. I fell in love with them, he would later recount. Inspired by this magical experience, Skelton dropped out of school to pursue a career in entertainment. At first, he was happy to just be on stage in any capacity, so he tried taking on some dramatic roles with the John Lawrence Theatre Company. Even though he was a natural entertainer, Skelton's early days on stage were full of mishaps. During a performance of Uncle Tom's Cabin, a hidden treadmill that he was on malfunctioned and started going backwards. Skelton couldn't contain his inner clown and broke character, shouting, Help! I'm backing into heaven, sending the audience into an uproarish laughter. Skelton got a job with a traveling medicine show, thrilling audiences with his physical comedy. Even as a teenager, he was making tens of dollars a week, sending all of his money back to his struggling family. When his mother expressed concern that he wasn't keeping any money for himself, he wrote back, We get plenty to eat, 
and we sleep in the wagon. But Vaudeville couldn't hold his attention forever. Skelton left Vaudeville Entertainment after it became too risque for his liking. For a while, he found his place working as an MC for dance contests. But it was a tougher crowd than he was accustomed to. One of the young winners, a young lady by the name of Edna Stilwell, told him after the show that she didn't care for his jokes. Never one to miss a beat, Skelton asked Stilwell if she thought that she could do any better. Turns out that she could. Less than a year later, Skelton and Stilwell got married and she began writing jokes for him. But that's not all that Stilwell did for him. She was definitely the strong woman behind the pantaline man. In addition to making Skelton funnier, Stilwell also made him smarter and richer. Seeing as though Skelton had dropped out of school, Stilwell had stepped in as his teacher and taught him all about the popular subjects, especially history. However, when Skelton's boss tried to cut his salary, he met the very unfunny side of Stilwell. After learning that Skelton's boss was going to cut his salary, Stilwell marched into his office. It's not clear what she said to the man, but when she came out, not only had she managed to prevent the pay cut, but she also secured a massive pay increase for Skelton. She also wrangled a whole host of other perks and concessions. But Skelton wasn't totally useless on his own. When Skelton and Stilwell ran out of money trying to cross the country, Skelton came up with an ingenious way to make quick money. He told Stilwell to start collecting empty SIG cartons. He then spent their last 50 cents on bars of soap, cut them up, and wrapped them in foil from the SIG cartons, selling them as eyeglass fogger removers. Skelton's second big break came in a Montreal dinner of all places. While eating there with Stilwell, Skelton came up with an act making fun of the way people dunked their donuts into their coffee. The relatability of the act made it an instant hit with audiences. In fact, it was so good that it even attracted the attention of a very important person. In 1937, President Franklin D. Roosevelt was so impressed with Skelton's Donut Dunkers act that he invited him to host his birthday at the White House. During one of the toasts, Skelton took hold of Roosevelt's glass and joked, Careful with what you drink, Mr. President. I got rolled in a place like this once. But the comic's sudden spark of success didn't end there. In fact, this was only the beginning. Skelton's performance at the White House turned into an overnight success. The entire East Coast entertainment scene couldn't get enough of Skelton's clean, physical humor. And before long, Hollywood came knocking. Famed funny man Mickey Rooney contacted Skelton and encouraged him to make the move across the country to the city of Angels. Skelton had tried and failed to break into Hollywood a few times before, but with no success. It wasn't until he performed his Donut Dunkers act with a few individuals for a screen test that Metro Goldwyn Mayer took note. But he soon discovered that the movie business wasn't all it was cracked up to be, at least not for clowns. MGM locked Skelton into a film contract that severely limited his ability to appear on stage or on the radio. And it's not like they had him starring in glamorous roles. For 1944's Bathing Beauty, for example, he appeared in a tutu. While he didn't mind that as a gag, he complained about having to shave his chest back and underarms. Instead of getting mad at the studios for restricting his true love for the stage, Skelton found a funny way to get even. While filming 1949's Neptune's Daughter, MGM had a special piano built for just one scene. While the big day came to film the scene with the piano, it mysteriously disappeared. But then, Skelton came to the rescue. 
Skelton informed MGM head Louis B. Mayer that he just so happened to have a piano exactly like the specialty built one at his apartment. Mayer didn't believe Skelton until he drove the studio boss to his apartment and showed him. Amazed, Mayer offered Skelton $50 a day to use the piano so they could resume filming. Oh, but that wasn't all. Skelton held out, knowing that the massive studio could afford to pay a lot more than $50 a day. Eventually, Mayer relented and agreed to pay Skelton $1,000 a day to use the piano. Apparently, it never occurred to Mayer that Skelton had, in fact, took the original piano from the set with help of some of the other studio hands. Skelton didn't necessarily enjoy his years making movies, but that's not to say that the studios treated him poorly. In fact, he was something of a big deal on set. While filming 1950's Watch the Birdie, Skelton played three roles. Accordingly, MGN gave him three separate trailers, one for each character. Funny enough though, they never did get back that piano. Even when he was on a film set, Skelton considered himself to be an entertainer first and an actor second. His preference to ad-lib his lines and improvise his scenes drove some directors crazy. Director Jack Donahue, for example, acclaimed, God help us all. If he manages to say it in English, write it down and we'll use it. Skelton seemed to be improvising his way through life. But it was all about to take a very unfortunate turn. Shortly after leaving MGM, Stillwell told Skelton that after 12 years of marriage, she was going to divorce him. At first, Skelton didn't believe her, that is, until he heard the news of his impending divorce on NBC. Both Skelton and Stillwell remained tight-lipped about the reason for their divorce. Despite the rumors, however, it appeared to be a healthy breakup. Stillwell continued to work as Skelton's manager and gag writer, confessing to the papers, I feel that it is more important to carry on for Red as his manager than to try to make a success of both jobs. Skelton didn't waste much time moving on from Stillwell. Less than a year later, he announced that he was engaged to a woman named Muriel Morris. In fact, Skelton claimed that he and Morris had obtained a marriage license and were intending to marry within a few days. If it seemed like there was an emergency, that's because there was. As a recently single man, Skelton found himself drafted into the service in the final years of World War II. While his status as an entertainer kept him far from the front lines, he was still subject to grueling conditions. Skelton performed as many as 12 shows a day, eventually causing him to have nervous breakdowns in 1945. But his comedy saved lives. Just before Skelton could marry Morris, she backed out of the deal. At first, she claimed that she had ended the engagement with Skelton so that she could marry a wealthy businessman in Mexico City. However, she later backtracked, claiming that there was no other man. All the same, Skelton had to pack his bags to join the US Army. As a celebrity and traveling entertainer with the US Army, Skelton had an immediate hit with the troops. Of course, he wasn't the only one allowed to crack jokes. When he arrived at Camp Roberts in California, his fellow serviceman put up a sign in his barracks store that read, Tour a movie star's home, 25 cents apiece. But the laughs didn't come for free. Skelton's nervous breakdown left him with a severe stutter and it seemed like his days of performing on stage had come to an end. But other servicemen had far more horrid injuries. While recovering, Skelton met another private whom the doctors did not expect to survive his wounds. 
Skelton decided to help him, and the consequences were jaw-dropping. Skelton dedicated most of his time in the hospital at Camp Pickett to boost the injured private's morale. After just a few good skits, his friend's health improved and the doctors removed him from the critical list. But that wasn't the only miracle. Once he found his funny bone again, Skelton's own stutter improved. In 1945, shortly before the end of his service, Skelton received a medical leave for an unspecific throat condition. His real motives, however, might have had more to do with a heart condition. During his leave, Skelton married the model Georgia Davis, saying, The only thing that bothers me is that I might ship over before I have time to get married. Free from his contract with MGM and finally the US Army, Skelton signed a television contract with NBC to expand his popular radio shows. This was the beginning of the Red Skelton Show, which ran from 1951 to 1971. Of course, in 20 years of entertainment television, Skelton provided the world with more than a few laugh-out-loud moments, planned or not. Skelton's fast-paced, unscripted humor made him hard to work with. For example, there was one time when NBC censored Skelton for two whole minutes. This was because of some sharply pointed jokes that he leveled at an imaginary studio executive. Following that incident, Skelton wouldn't have as much free reign ever again. Famed comedy writer Sherwood Schwartz joined the Red Skelton show after it moved to CBS, and Schwartz made sure to keep Skelton on his toes. He had it written into his contract that Skelton couldn't discuss the script with him prior to taping, leading to awkward moments when Skelton would break character and say to audiences, Don't blame me folks, I don't write this stuff. Around the same time, Skelton suffered a heart scar that nearly ended his career and life prematurely. The comedian fell down a flight of stairs, injuring his ankle and suffering a cardiac asthma attack. Paramedics rushed him to St. John's Hospital in Santa Monica, where the doctor said if there were 10 steps to death, Red Skelton had taken 9 of them by the time he had arrived. According to some sources, Skelton never touched a drop of hooch. Other sources, however, say he leaned heavily into drinking given his intense work schedule and the marital problems that he encountered following his son's passing. After decades on the air, and despite still putting in record numbers, CBS canceled the Red Skelton show. While Skelton bowed out gracefully, behind the scenes he held a grudge. It was against the studio executives that he had felt had stabbed him in the back. It wasn't the first time that Skelton had ever been taken off the air though. In July 1951, Skelton boarded a plane from Rome to attend a four-week engagement in London. While they were in mid-flight, two of the plane's four engines gave out. Under more strain, it seemed likely that the other two engines would also give out, sending the plane and its passengers on a crash course towards a mountain. Assured that they were all about to meet a fiery end, a priest on board the plane readied himself to administer the final rites, and he encouraged Skelton to do the same, saying, You take care of your department, Red, and I'll take care of mine. Skelton managed to entertain the passengers with funny remarks. Well, surprisingly, the plane made a safe landing at a small airstrip in France. Skelton lived for the thrill of performing, and at the end of every performance, when the audience had gone home, he would return to the empty stage and stand in silence. All by himself, he would repeat the unsettling line, Tomorrow, I must start again. One hour ago, I was a big man. I was important out there. Now, it's empty. It's all gone. Audiences knew Skelton as the red-headed comedian and the funny clown. But, deep down, he was truly an artist. At one point in time, his art dealer said they believed that he made more money selling artwork than he did from his career as an entertainer. But he also wrote short stories and songs. Allegedly, throughout his life, he composed over 8,000 songs and symphonies. 
Just when it seemed like Skelton had everything, he lost the only thing that really mattered to him. He had two kids with his second wife, Georgina Davis, a daughter named Valentina, and a son named Richard. Tragically, just 10 days before Richard's 10th birthday in May 1958, he succumbed to his battle with leukemia. All of a sudden, Skelton was out of laughs. But in the end, he revealed his secret to a happy life. My mother told me something I'd never forget. He said, don't take life too seriously, son. You don't come out of it alive anyway. Don't forget, if you've enjoyed this story or stories alike, make sure to show some love by subscribing and liking this video. Stay tuned for some more informative and exciting stories like this one.